Hi, my name is Jerry Siagi, and in this video, I'll be going over PSAT NMSQT tips plus strategy to help you guys ace your upcoming PSAT test. So to start, what is the PSAT? So while the PSAT is called a practice test, the NMSQT, which is administrated to the juniors, actually does have some significance in matters because it determines whether or not you'll qualify for this scholarship called the National Merit Scholarship, which basically is a $2,500 scholarship offered by the National Merit Scholarship Foundation. And in addition to this, if you become a finalist, some colleges and some corporations offer scholarships in addition to these um, scholarships that the corporation provides. So doing good on this test is important for those kind of things. And to get started, I just want to go into the format of the test. So if you've ever taken the SAT, the, sorry, the number of questions and the timing is exactly the same as SAT. So reading, writing, you're going to have 32 minutes and 27 questions and 32 minutes and 27 questions for the second module. So two modules, each has 27 questions. And if you do the math, that means you have to be sending one minute and 10 seconds per question. On the math section, you have 35 minutes to answer 22 questions and 35 minutes to answer 22 questions in the second module. Do the math, it's about one minute and 35 seconds per question. So what I want to show with these numbers, again, is that the questions are quick, right? You should not be spending two minutes on a question, unless it's a harder question, right? But you should be trying to spend under a minute and 35 seconds on math and under a minute and 10 seconds for reading and writing. Now, obviously, some questions are longer, so you might want to spend more time on those. But again, the general rule is to kind of be under this time to do well. And so this time kind of thing goes into my first tip, general tip, which is around time management. So you have to be quick on this test, right? As I just showed you guys before, there's a lot of questions and not a lot of time. And so being quick especially is relevant to module two, because module one, the questions are usually easier, so you might get into this kind of like comfortable state where you're going like spending more time maybe module two it definitely picks up and the questions get harder which means you really got to be careful about your time again use my rule if you're going to think it's going to take more than whatever time one minute 10 seconds or one minute 35 seconds right then skip okay so i think the strategy is you want to first before you even answer the question just think how long will this take me how long will it take for me to answer this question do I have a plan if it's a math question? Do, if it's a reading question, is this a long passage? Do I really understand the passage? It's like a science passage. And if you think it's going to take longer, right, then skip the question and come back to it later. Also, another tip is on the reading section, start at question round 14. And the reason why is question 14 on the reading writing section starts with grammar. And I think for me at least, starting with grammar is way easier than it is to start with reading. I think reading is definitely more stressful than grammar, which kind of has a set of rules. So starting question 14 kind of easy in the tests in terms of time. My second tip, and this one's kind of odd, is to don't be comfortable during the tests, right? So you never want to get into kind of like a flow state sort of. You don't want to really get into like a lull, right? You always want to be alert and like focused because the way you make mistakes is when you get into this comfortable state where you're not really like paying attention, you're just kind of like flowing through it, right? And it sounds kind of counterproductive, right? But you don't want to be comfortable because that state, when we're kind of just like thinking about the questions, sort of, think, not really thinking about it, is when we make mistakes. So the best way to do this, again, is to be focused, active. Um, you know, you want to read carefully, right? You want to make sure that you're actually trying to think about the problems. And again, the reason why is we make mistakes in this comfortable state. So try not to be comfortable. Always be alert and ready for the test. And again, being alert also means you're time conscious. So you should be looking at the time. You should be kind of judging how much time am I spending, how much time do I have left, how much questions do I have left, and just kind of thinking about strategy while you take the test. Third tip, you always want to answer what the question is asking. Right, so on the SAT, they try to trick you up because what they do is they have answer choices that are correct by the passage or by whatever, but they don't actually answer the question that's being asked. So always, always, always 
you know, at the end of the problem, just check that you're answering the right question, right? That the question answer you picked answers the question they're asking. Because they try to check you by having answers that are correct, but not answering the question. And so this also goes with don't overlook words, especially in the question, right? So you want to make sure that you're not overlooking any of the keywords, because they do have keywords in the questions and answer choices that you look for. And you also don't want to pick extreme answer choices. And this is kind of more prevalent on the reading section, obviously. But if it questions like always or like um, absolutely or whatever, it's kind of extreme and usually isn't correct. But sometimes it can be. But again, extreme kind of isn't usually correct. And finally, of course, is kind of basic strategy, but process elimination, right? It's a helpful strategy just to you know kind of cross off answers and just you know decide between a smaller set of uh, answer choices than larger set. Next, we'll go into specific strategies for reading writing. So for reading, you definitely want to try to read the question first. And the reason why is you want to be laser focused on finding the answer. Right? You're not trying to read the passage for enjoyment. You're not even trying to read the passage to understand everything it's saying. You're reading the passage to answer the question. And so if that help, helps, read the question first so you know what to look for, and then you're not going to spend so much time just like trying to understand it all. To be laser focused into finding the answer to that question by reading the passage. Second, how do we read hard passages? So if you watch my video on the hard passages, I go into more depth on how to read hard passages, like science passages. But the basic idea is, I think, personally, computer annotations are kind of clunky, right? The highlighting tools and the whatever tools they offer are kind of clunky. And I think the best way to kind of read hard passages and digest what's happening is to use a piece of paper and take short notes. So when I'm saying take short notes, I don't even mean like sentence. I don't mean like a phrase. I literally just mean like words and like arrows and like whatever that helps you just like actively read the passage and kind of stay in tune with the passage. Because a lot of times when we're reading the science passages, what happens is we get lost or we just start reading with our eyes and we don't actually process what's happening. And so always you really want to be processing what happens. And so, you know, kind of just taking notes on a piece of paper, just jotting down whatever kind of helps you to process the passage and kind of, you know, think, think through it, right? It really isn't important what you write on the uh, piece of paper, as long as you're writing about something from the passage, right? You kind of like start to actively read it if you do that. And another trick is the called the auto now trick. This works more on the reading, sorry, the writing passages. And basically how this trick works is if you have three answer choices that are all the same like tense or the same plurality, for example, like with the verb question, right? If they're all the same and there's one auto noun, chances are the auto, the auto now is going to be correct. And the reason why is because you can't have three answer choices that are basically the same, same category, and the other one's auto now. The auto one's going to be correct because you can only have one answer choice to the question. But don't rely on the strategy. Rely on knowing the rules and the um, content. And that finally connects to the last kind of point. So no assumptions, right? You always just want to be supporting your... Um, answer choices using the passage or using grammar rules. And you also don't want to go for a sounds right, because they know that some question answer choices sound right, but they aren't grammatically correct. So don't rely on just like using your ear for the writing questions. You know, prove it's right with grammar rules. And finally, I think also trusting your gut is a big thing too. I think we tend to overthink when we're under like pressure, like in this case. But um, I think trusting your gut and just going with your instinct can help in this um, state. Next, for math, um, you know, rely on Desmos, right? Desmos can do a lot. So some helpful things Desmos can do is it can, you know, do some stuff with constants. It can solve equations and systems. And, of course, it's good at doing calculations, so just plugging in calculations. But know when to not use it as well, right? There's some cases when you can't use Desmos, and trying to use it is just going to waste your time there's no way you'll be able to use Desmos to solve the question. So knowing when to not use it is an important strategy because you don't want to waste time just like plugging stuff into Desmos and seeing, okay, can I get the answer using Desmos? It's a good tool, but sometimes you can't solve the question using Desmos. And so this is why you need to also know how to solve questions without Desmos. 
Right, so during this period, before the test, you want to practice using Desmos, and you want to also practice not using Desmos. You can solve these harder questions that can't use Desmos. You also want to double check, obviously, right? So when you're double checking, usually I have extra time, but um, when you have extra time and you're double checking, try to solve the problem in different ways. There's multiple ways to solve a problem in SAT, and trying to solve it in different ways helps you to really verify your answer. And finally, the only reason you'd make a mistake on math is if you just kind of make a mistake, which again, you can correct by staying alert and being careful. And the other reason you can make a mistake is if you don't understand the content, so unfamiliar with the topic, right? This you can um, alleviate by learning the skills. And another reason is if it's tricky wording. So the wording is weird, and the way you alleviate this kind of a trap or this kind of mistake is by doing practice problems. So the more problems that you do, the more practice you have, the more kind of you get used to the type of questions they ask and how they kind of format it. And so those are really the two things to kind of like work on and improve during your practice before the test. And yeah, those are my general tips plus my reading, writing, slash math specific tips, all condensed into one kind of video for the PSAT. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you guys all tomorrow. Bye.